teach me to listen I don't want to see anymore Give me a vision That you could move this heart To be set apart I don't need to recognize the man in the mirror And I don't want to trade your plan for something familiar I can't waste a day, I can't stay the same I want to be different, I want to be changed Till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright The whole world can see that there's something different So come and be different in me And I don't want to spend my life stuck in a pattern And I don't want to gain this world but lose what matters And so I'm giving up Everything because I wanna be different I wanna be changed Till all of me is gone And all that remains Is a fire so bright The whole world can see That there's something different So come and be up where we were but I'm gonna tell you the truth I have been sifted like wheat from the devil and I'm um, going through something and uh, you know I know the Lord has a purpose for it I know he's bettering me because I am far from perfect and uh, don't claim to be but I know he's doing something amazing. I always tell you that, guys. But you know, it's the truth. He is doing something so amazing. And um, one of the things that holds us back from seeing is we have these preconceived notions of what the Lord is doing, what we've been told, what we've been taught. But when we dig deep in the Word, it's a whole different ball game. But... I've been being led for quite some time, especially of late, that it's time to bolt the door. And we can't take that in the wrong context either. It is talking about just as when we are to go into our secret place with the Lord and shut the door. And that was what Jesus was talking about. And he told us, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Look, we've been told that this is something that it's not, you know. This is our one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. This is our time that he's changing us. This is our time that we're with him 
and we have inner peace and we're communing with him and you know I just can't get past his feet guys I just cannot get past his feet and and I look up at his face and I just see the Sun bright so bright I can make his silhouette out and um, all I can do is hang on for dear life and the good thing about it is when we enter into this secret place with our with our Lord well the enemy can't come there guys that is one place that's off limits to him so the more we spend the time there uh, the less we are in the face of the enemy and the Lord strengthens us and um, you know when you have searched the world over for an earthly answer to our earthly problems that also are spiritual problems that manifest in this life on the earth uh, there's only one answer and that's our Lord and Savior Jesus Yeshua the Christ the Messiah Hamashiach and um, it is time to start guarding what we are letting in as far as the darkness the world is getting really dark and um, the Lord is wanting to purge us of those things and our faults and uh, it's painful and you can feel like you're drowning and you can feel like you just have no strength left but I can tell you that his uh, strength is made perfect in our weakness and the joy of the Lord is our strength is, is his strength it, it is that's our joy it's his strength and, um, you know, the more time we spend in this prayer closet, well, the devil doesn't like it. And he's going to do everything he can to keep us from going there. He's going to keep us distracted. He's going to send stalking spirits to stalk our peace, to stalk our peace of mind, to rob us. And um, it's something that, you know, when you're in a vice grip and you're in the oil press, you want to just scream out and you want to run and you want to avoid it at all costs. But it's something that has to happen to press the oil out. You know, the story in the life of David is just so relatable to me. I can just relate. Not that I'm King David or I have any kind of position like that. No, no. It's just I can totally see things in his life. Mistakes he made. Challenges. Just, he was the real image of a man but he had a heart for God and he had weaknesses and he had issues <laughs> he was not perfect by far David was not perfect and I remember learning about King David when I was in Sunday school as a kid and we knew that Jesus came from the root of Jesse and David but you assume that that is just a story about perfection right about a perfect walk with God for it for that to be where Jesus came from right through Mary <clears throat> but nothing could be further from the truth when you really read about David's life and I can really relate to so many things. I mean, David had some serious issues in his household. He truly did. But, you know, David knew the Lord very well as a, as a young lad, and he slew the Philistine. David slew Goliath, the giant. And he was a redeemer type. You know, he was a type of Christ, a redeemer of Israel when he killed the Philistine. And... 
he had to flee for his life from King Saul, from the enemy. Uh, he had to flee from his own son, Absalom, who had done some pretty bad things. And David had a problem with, you know, incest in his house between his children. I mean, it is not a pretty story. It's not. I mean, it's pretty, uh, no wonder we didn't hear about so many of these things, uh, that people don't cover these scriptures because, you, you know, it's, it's really hard for, uh, people to wrap their minds around this type of thing. I mean, we knew, most people knew about Bathsheba and him and, uh, that would be covered, but, you know, where his son, uh, raped his daughter, and then Absalom uh, took his brother's life. Uh, you know, Absalom went to the dark side, guys. And um, then he wanted to be take David's place. And you have to realize, we're living in a spiritual world. We really are. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness and high places. And it affects flesh and blood. And uh, it's just amazing when we see the life of David in the truth that it is. The glory, the ugliness, the darkness, the struggle, and the victories. I mean, David even was uh, under the influence of Satan to number the men of Israel. And it caused calamity upon the nation and many died for his mistake and if you remember King Saul he came after David uh, you know David was to be anointed and uh, was the anointed one for the kingship but that way he was just a young boy you know and uh Saul was still king, and Saul, you know, was displeasing. He turned displeasing to God, and so God put an evil spirit on Saul because he went to the witch of Endor. He went to wizards that peep, familiar spirits, and um, he had a curse over him, and, and then he would, God used that to strengthen David. David had to flee for his life. And the only time that Saul would be calm was when David played the harp. But um, in 1 Samuel 19, 2, you will see Jonathan. He really loved. Jonathan was Saul's son. And he and David were just so close. They were like blood brothers. You know, they even had like a blood, blood pact between the two of them. Which is where we hear about blood brothers, you know. And all of us as kids, we had somebody very close to us and we'd prick our fingers and do that, you know, kind of thing. I know I did. And, um, David and Jonathan had this kind of love for one another, a brotherly, strong brotherly love. Well, Saul was really out of his mind. He was insane and he was under the, uh, influence and control of a demonic spirit and uh, in first 19 first Samuel 19 we see that uh, Saul was wanting to kill David and he told Jonathan and all his servants that they they have to kill David but Jonathan loved David truly loved him and so he warned him and he said Saul my father seeks to kill you therefore I pray you take heed to thyself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where there are and I will commune with my father about you and what I see, then I'll tell you. Okay? So, 
just think of Saul as your enemy, your spiritual enemy, that fleeing serpent that loves to torment you and stalk you, okay? Because we all have them. We all have them. And uh, that's why we deal with the same types of repetitive issues over and over and over in our life. And we can get away from one person and it's going to come out in another person. And you're standing there going, am I losing my mind? How can this be happening? It's like the same persecutions. It's the same abuse. It's the same. It, it's just different people, different faces. You know, I went through relationships upon relationships upon relationships when I was young. And I was always fleeing this type of spirit. And it wouldn't matter how wonderful it started out. It wouldn't matter how much different of a personality type and lifestyle these people lived. It, it, they, the relationship ended up the same. The same. And so, of course, you know, I'm always uh, looking at myself saying, what is it about me that this keeps happening over and over and over again? And I would try different patterns and I would do different things and I'd change my life drastically, drastically. I would change my life. I would move into, you know, before when I was young, I was really kind of lost. And so, of course, I was around other lost people. And you're young and you don't have any roots and, and you're just floating all over the place. And, you know, you find love in all the wrong places, right? And so, what you think is love anyway. And then you mature and you grow and you start moving in completely different circles. You start getting educated. You start, you know, doing different, you're living your life completely different. And, of course, some of those people from your life, you're still hooked to them, whether you've had children with them or, or you still know same people in the same circles or things like that, you know. But you'll move on to something completely different, and there comes, you know, it might be a year, might be two years, might be six months, you don't ever know. And then all of a sudden, the same abusive, crazy spirit just starts coming out. And... Um, <clears throat> And you, you've changed, you know, you've even changed yourself, but you weren't doing it in the Lord. You were doing it the world's way. And uh, you'd still see all this same things happen over and over and over. And that, that's really what I've seen all my life. And um, you start realizing, well, I just should have never done anything. I should have just stayed with where I was and it made no difference what I did. And, the, the, you know, you go on down that rabbit hole. And so until we see it with our spiritual eyes and we see that there are certain susceptibilities about our walk and who we are and our spirits that the devil just knows where to hit you where you live he just does and uh, it's your deepest uh most secretive things that it took you maybe even a long time to figure it out on your own that these things really push your buttons and the devil knew it before you did be abusive very abusive well this is the kind of things David saw himself situations and and uh, so if you can just imagine that Saul is like this the enemy that is going to chase you that is going to really put you through it and it wants to take your life but it can't because you have the hand of God, protective hand of God. But God allows it so that you become a victor in Christ. So that you have your, your faith grows and you go from faith to faith and glory to glory. Well, that's what was happening to David here. And Jonathan was his brother and he loved him. I mean, they weren't you know, actual brothers, but they they had brotherly love. This was like the representative of the Church of Philadelphia between Jonathan and David. And David looked out, you know, Jonathan looked out for David and David looked out for Jonathan. And, um, and what does Jonathan do? So he goes out to where Saul is with him in the fields and he speaks good about David to his father Saul. And um, he says, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, 
and because his works have been to the to towards you very good for he did put his life in his hand and he slew the philistine yes the giant goliath and the lord wrought a great salvation for all israel thou sawest and you did rejoice Lord, father wherefore thou will thou sin against innocent blood to slay david without a cause and so Saul hearkened unto the voice of his son Jonathan, and Saul sware, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, <clears throat> and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. And Saul sent the messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him. Actually, I think her name is Michal. All right. Not Michael. Michal. David's wife told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and he fled and he escaped. All right. And then she put, um, she made up like, he, like David was in the bed. Okay. And uh, she used pillows and um, all this stuff and fake that David was in the bed. And so when the mess Saul sent the messengers to take David, she told him, well, he's in the bed sick. And so Saul sent the messengers again to see David. And they said, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. They were going to kill him. And the messengers, when they came in, there was an image on the bed. It looked like, you know, it looked like a lump in the bed. You know, have you ever done that? Like when you snuck out at night? your parents house when you're a teenager and you stuck the pillows up and uh you know then mccall she was in trouble with saul because he was like why why have you deceived me so oh sorry guys let me turn that off and he's saul's like upset with her and he's like why have you deceived me so and sent away my enemy that he has escaped and my call answered saul and he and he said unto me let me go why should i kill thee so David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naioth. Well, so what am I bringing this up for? Because that was Jonathan told David to go and hide yourself in secret. Okay. Away from the enemy, which was Jonathan's father, Saul. And, um. He begged him, he said, you know, go and take and hide yourself until the morning and abide there in secret, in your, in a secret place. And that is just as what Jesus is saying to us in Matthew 6, 6, that we have this secret place that the enemy just cannot reach us there. And, um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could just stay there? You know, we can commune with him all day long, but when we spend that quality time and we're approaching the Holy of Holies and we can do it anywhere, anytime, you know, and, and, uh, in these days, guys, we got to get there more and more and more. And in the meantime, we are to clean out our spiritual closet. We've got to clean our spiritual closet out because there are infirmities in us. There are things that are painful to admit are there. And it can be wounds, it can be scars, it can be darkness stalking us, trying to get into our heart. You can start, that's why we do not be angry and sin not, do not, let, do not let that anger enter into your heart. Lay it down, lay it down. I don't care what anyone says or does to you, lay it down, lay it down. It might seem so justified to defend yourself, to argue, to get angry. But every time we do that, we're taking in a bit of that kingdom of darkness inside of us. And we've got to get it out. We've got to rend it. It is what God's asking us to do. And to take his heart 
and keep our eyes on Jesus and and, and what would Jesus you know you know that that cliche that everybody's got used to have the bumper sticker what would Jesus do what would Jesus do but it's really it's really true what would Jesus do or say what did Jesus do and say because man will twist it all up he really will you know Jesus was very radical and you got to remember the only people that Jesus really let have it were the very religious the law keepers that used it to control the people so why is it that we're in a beast system that's a decrony mm, decronian law you know why is it why is it that it makes it look oh so holy oh so righteous oh so right and it's not based there's no mercy there's no grace there's no forgiveness and when we operate from that spirit of the world we can become that and it'll look we'll think we're so right we will think this is justice that was a slap in the face for me to realize and uh, you know we'll catch ourselves going back to that you know well you'll feel justified to snap back you'll feel justified to give that person a little darkness back you know what I'm saying because that was I, I got really good at throwing it back. You know, before I was walking with the Lord, I mean, I was quick-witted and it just rolled right off my tongue. And i that is something I am not proud of. Not. And here, we're going to go to John, the book of John. And we're going to go to... Um, Let's see, I'm going to go to John, uh, let's see, chapter 20, because something happens when the door is shut that really came and stuck out at me in the scriptures, and this was after Jesus had resurrected, and he saw Mary Magdalene there in the uh, garden at the tomb. And uh, she was weeping. And um, she thought they had took Jesus away. And she saw the two angels in white sitting at the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus was laying. And, and here's his, you know, grave clothes. The, tr the turban, the part that was on his head was still, you know, they, they looked exactly like he just evaporated out of them right but she thought they had took him away and um, the angels were asking her you know madam why weepest thou and she said unto them because they took away my Lord and I know not where they've laid him and having said these things she turned half around and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus and Jesus said unto her woman why weepest thou whom seekest thou who are you looking for? Woman, madam, why are you weeping? What, who are you seeking? And she thought it was a gardener, okay? She didn't even recognize him. And she said unto him, Sir, if thou did bear him hence, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and said unto him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which is to say master. She recognized him. When he called her name, she didn't recognize him when he first spoke and asked her why she was weeping. And Jesus said unto her, Do not be holding me, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. She started telling him, Go to the disciples tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God wow 
So what did she do? She went and she got the disciples and she told them, look, you know, she's, she's telling them, I saw him. Okay. And she's telling the disciples, we're in verse 18 of chapter 20 here. Mary Magdalene cometh and tell, telling the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Therefore, the same day at evening, which was the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the doors were shut, pay attention to that. When the doors were shut, the disciples were on account of the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Okay, don't skip over this. It was the first day of the week. And the doors were shut because they were fearful of the Jews. And Jesus just appeared. He, the doors were shut. He couldn't have walked through the door. He came in the spiritual sense. Okay. He didn't knock on the door. <laughs> He just was there. And it happens twice. This was the first time. Okay? And when he had said, and, and what, what, remember what he said to them, peace be unto you. That's what he said. That's how he announced himself. And he stood in the midst of them. Okay? Because he was letting them know, I'm not an enemy. I'm not the threat. You're safe. It's me. Okay? And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Therefore said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, I also send you. See, the Father sent Christ, the Son, by himself. But the Son sends his disciples with an escort or a guard. The Holy Spirit, okay? Now, this is before they received the Holy Spirit in the upper room with the 120. Yeah. Guys, this is, this is coming for us. This is coming for us. We're going to experience this. We truly are. And it's so near. It is so near. Oh, it's so near. And everything we've experienced is going to be so, it's just like, it'll be, we'll be past it. We won't be focusing on the pain or all the, the damage that has been done to us. Going through what we've been through in this life. I mean, the truth is guys, I shouldn't even be here. I'm, in, I'm sure many of you shouldn't either. And even if by other, some other grace that I would live, I shouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I should have never accomplished anything. I shouldn't even be able to get up every day. I shouldn't even be able to talk about the Lord. I should not have any faith. I should not. If it were in my power. No. See, he's keeping us. He's guarding us. He's preserving us for something so magnificent. So. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye power from on high. This is coming. This is coming, guys. He breathed on them. Just like God breathed on Adam and gave Adam the breath of life. So that he became a living soul. He's breathed, he breathes on his apostles. They became apostles here. That they may receive divine power. You know, and Satan has his little mimics this too. You know, this is what he does. This is what he does when he tries to get people into witchcraft and the arts and all this other stuff. You know what I'm saying? But... This is the real deal. Satan's just a really cheap imitation copycat that can never, ever, ever be the real deal. 
He's a walking dead man. He's a deceiver. You know, he's like a magician. That's it. He's, he's all smoke and mirrors. He's not the real thing. Oh, yes. He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye power from on high. The first fruits, guys. The first fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Not only on the apostles, but those that were with them. This is what happened in the in the upper room with the 120, the 120, which is divine probation. Okay? <laughs> 40 is probation. Like going through the wilderness 40 years. You know, Moses went through the, the wilderness 40 years before he was in the wilderness for 40 years with the Israelites. Okay? <laughs> you know, Moses spent the majority of his life in the wilderness he lived to be 120 years old 120 and 80 of those years 40 two sets of 40 he served in the wilderness he was in the wilderness in probation trials he went through the wilderness on his own for 40 years before he was called by god to lead the israelites out of egypt for and to wander around for 40 years but his total life was 120. Three sets of 40. It's amazing, guys. It's all tied together. It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. You're not, you know. I, that number means a lot to me. It, it does because God showed me something. He really did. And the upper room and the 120. I, I mean, I'm telling you. Guys, this is coming. The Lord is doing something so amazing. And you know, we don't give up hope on anything or anybody. We know who's doomed and who's damned, okay? That's why we're to judge nothing before the time. Ah, oh, we, we just, look, this is his business. This is his business. And he's doing something. But he gives us a glimpse when we're looking. When we're actually looking... And you're almost afraid to say that's what it really is. Because the world, the Christian world, has told you something completely different. Okay? And he says, what does he say to them once he says, receive you power from on high? Whosoever sins you forgive, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained you know, that is really powerful there. Okay? Because what did he tell us to do? To forgive as we have been forgiven. Or else our Father in Heaven will not forgive us. It's, it's forgiveness. Okay? But remember, repentance. <laughs> There has to be repentance, remission of sins. So we are to let people know if you do not repent, you will not be forgiven by our Father in heaven because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that sins are forgiven. This was a gift, a gift. This was forgiveness. This was the price was paid no one else could have done this but God himself that went up on that cross. Emmanuel, Jesus, Yeshua the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And so much happened on that cross that if you don't really understand everything that went on on that cross, more than what the church will just skim over to tell you, If you really know what it really depth the depths of what he did on that cross that he took in upon himself all darkness all sin all curses all disease death I mean he absorbed that to where the earth the world became dark three hours of darkness and now he's he he has the right to come back 
and to defeat this kingdom of darkness and set the prisoners free. Because Satan, the oppressor, would not, would not loose the prison. And the prisoners will not be loosed until Jesus returns. And there will be no denying that he loosed the prisoners. And a lot of those prisoners are the ones you've already said are damned. That there's no hope for them. That they are already walking dead with Satan. We had, you know, we just put our noses in places that don't belong. We do. We mess it all up. You know, I have, the Lord has just humbled me so much that every time I have a preconceived notion, every time I think I know something on my own, I'm wrong every single time. And it's humbling because you cannot put God in a box and you cannot say he can only move this way and that way and he's going to only do this and he's only going to do that. And no, you cannot do it. You will miss him every time. You will put his, you will cut off his arms to save. You, you will totally try to remove his omnipotent power from on high. And that is very dangerous. And I've been guilty of it before. I have done it in my own ignorance. And you know what? He has shut my mouth time after time after time. Even about myself, he shut my own mouth. When I was sitting there trying to explain some health problems I was having. And I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And all these other things. And I'm talking to a sister. And I'll never forget that day. He just convicted me so deep in my spirit. And I heard him say something so deep in my spirit. And he said, how do you know what I'm doing? And when I humbled myself on that. And I pondered it. And I had to seek forgiveness. He showed me this. And you talk about having both your feet in your mouth. You talk about your narrow-mindedness. You talk about dark-hearted. He showed me those corners in my own heart. Because that's a Pharisee spirit. And I thought I had walked away from that legalism. But you know what? There are roots sometimes in our hearts that we have no clue. We have no clue that that's what's going on in us. And that is why it's so important that we go into this secret place with him. And I'm telling you, you're going to shed some tears and you might wail and you might cry. And you just, all you can do is cling on to him and say, take it, Lord, and preserve me. Because I'm telling you, you know, there's the one unforgivable sin. And that is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And I know there's much ado about it. But I can tell you. God is guarding us. He's preserving us. He's keeping us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And why was he so hard on the Pharisees? And, and he was the only one. I mean, they were the only ones that he got down and dirty and really let them know their faults because they should have known better. They were the keepers and the guards of the word of God. And that was the only way that people could know what the word said was what they allowed to be read in the temple. There weren't like just the scrolls were in the temple. No one could just go up and read them. They had to be read to the people and they had to congregate to be read to and they would pick and choose and cherry pick and they wanted to use it as power to control the people and i'm telling you that 
it's really kind of the same way today because people will take scripture out of context and use it for monetary gain. Telling you to sow a seed and donate this and sow a seed, get your blessing met and just selling short the power of God for filthy lucre's sake. I mean, it's, it's bad. And just, my heart bleeds for these people that have fallen into this because not all go into it with that intention. It's just, you gotta be careful who you enjoin yourself to, who you invite in. And then once you're hooked to the money and you've got to pay, you know, $25,000 a month in airing time and you're under a network, uh, you can only say what they want you to say. There's a line and they won't let you cross it. And you still got to beg for money. I, I mean, it, because they get a portion of it. And this happens in the bigger congregations. Because it's controlled. They can't just teach what they want. They can't, the sermons have to go by a guideline. It, it's sad. And that was one of the things that I started noticing in my walk was I was like where's this where's the power where's the power in the church why are we not seeing real true miracles and you know you're being faked out by a lot of these people it's a, it's a show and it's sad because they're doing it for money and they'll send you things in the mail and they're like these fortune tellers they use the same uh, operating techniques as fortune tellers they go by what you're telling them when you say oh will you pray for my so-and-so will you pray for my for me will you pray for my family and you you say what your issue is and then they exploit it and say well, you give us a hundred dollars and you're going to get a ten thousand dollar blessing send us a thousand dollars you might you're going to get a fifty thousand dollar blessing i mean this is the stuff they're doing they're going to get a rude awakening and i i, I mean there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth i mean i can just imagine it's it's heartbreaking so that's why we need to pray for our brethren i mean it's you know satan loves the pulpit guys he does and then he wants to cut short the saving arms of god when you are saying that the precious blood of jesus christ is not powerful enough to forgive a certain sin or a certain situation and when we you know there's different levels of accountability i mean someone who is 21 years old and has the wisdom of solomon is more accountable than someone who's 50 years old and doesn't have the wherewithal to comprehend and understand it's different, it, you know, the, just because someone's of age doesn't mean they're accountable. We're in a broken, broken, fallen world. And thing, things are broken. People's minds are broken. People's intellect, people's ability to grasp or understand. And then when you patch on all the deceits and the fakes and the lies well then they're even they're, they want to turn away completely they don't trust anybody so we can see there's been much damage done you know and it, it stops us from 
being able to reach people that otherwise would listen. And, you know, there's congregations that don't follow these strict rules and aren't under somebody, you know, they could be non-denominational and they're not under the guidelines of a actual organization. And they spend all their money on airtime and they do nothing to help feed the homeless or the prisoners or you know nothing and, and and you know guys our fruits are going to tell where our heart is if we're following jesus the true jesus we're going to do the labors of his love because he said as you've done unto the least of these you've done also unto me and you know, I, I remember when I really was on fire and, and learning about God and studying the Bible under, you know, a certain ministry, they had me believing that, oh, that's to your brethren. Um, you know, you don't have to forgive someone that's not your brethren. Uh, you don't have to... <clears throat> follow those rules of Jesus unless it's talking about your brethren. Everybody else is your enemy. What? You know, I mean, I something told me deep in my soul, in my spirit, you know, if you pay attention, the truth is in us. The light that is in the life of man, kind, humanity, that is Christ. He is He's the power of God that breathed onto us and gave us life to have sustaining life and a soul it was created by our creator. His truth is in there. And I can say that, you know, yeah, I've seen people on their deathbeds uh, some people don't just pass away like that. Some people lay there for days in a transition period. And you can see their eyes are just gone. They're going through the dying process. We don't know what a soul is experiencing at that time. And there are people that were non-believers who had a a near-death experience and came back as a believer when they came to or, or were healed and recovered they had some kind of experience see God's ways are not our ways the flesh can get in the way a lot of times I know my flesh does it gets in my way of the true power of Christ and the Holy Spirit our flesh can get in the way our narrow-mindedness, our thinking God only works A, B, C, or black and white. But the truth is, it's a complicated thing. There's things that happen that are outside the body of what we're seeing. We don't know what someone else is experiencing in a death experience. Some people are there to witness it, and it's for them, for the witnesses to see it. Look at the, the event that happened to Paul. He was killing Christians. And the Lord struck him down on the road to Damascus, and he had a full-on experience out of the body. And he ended up writing a lot of the New Testament and taking the message to the Gentiles. Oh, how can we forget that? You think God doesn't do things like that today? I'm not saying, hey, the word's been written, okay? They're not adding any more books to the Bible that are, God's word is complete. 
but he's still doing something in humanity. So we don't get to know what's going on outside of this little realm here when people are out unconscious or having some kind of a experience in the body. I hope you're following what I'm saying. I know if, you're, if you've worked in hospice or you've worked in the medical field where you're around people passing away, you know what I'm talking about. And they could have been a non-believer and all of a sudden they're saying things and experiencing something that is not in our realm. We just don't understand. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, someone could be laying in a coma, okay? And to us, we're standing there, and we just see the person laying there. And we have no idea what they're experiencing. And people used to think, oh, well, they're in a coma, so they're not aware of anything that's going on out here. And people would talk about them, and people would talk about the situation, and people would just act like you know yeah that person's already dead okay because they're in a coma that's not true now they know that the hearing is the last thing to go even in a coma someone can still hear there's people that have woke up out of long-term comas and can tell you i heard you playing that music i heard you tell me to keep fighting i heard you praying for me See, our little pea brain minds <laughs> can't comprehend the vastness of God. We think everything is black, white, and gray, and we think that it's us that does, does it, and it's not. It's not. It's just like um, people that have an opinion about the timing of the return of our Lord or using the word rapture to describe it or whatever, okay? And there are certain believers that will just get downright nasty with you if you use that word <clears throat> and um, will call them apostates and say all kinds of things about someone believing in a timing issue of the return of our Lord and treat their own brethren like an enemy and then they get stuck on this. This is all they think about. And if someone even has a belief about that, um, say they believe in a pre-tribulation gathering together of the rapture, and you will just see their fangs come out. And I'm sorry, but guys, but that is not of God. Because I'm, I'm gonna explain something to you. The Holy Spirit is powerful. And if someone loves their Lord and is serving them, serving him, even if they might have a misunderstanding about the word or the timing, I'm sorry, but if that person is here, the, don't discount the Holy Spirit of what it's doing. We act like the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. And we become an offender. <laughs> Guilty, did it. I'm so thankful that God opened my eyes about this. As I, I mean, I really think that's a grave error. It's a grave mistake. Because we're selling short the Holy Spirit. We're saying that we're cutting off his saving arms. You know, and, and the truth is, People are going home to meet the Lord every day. Every day. And many will go home before the Lord returns. As a matter of fact, the majority will. And if we sell short the Holy Spirit revealing truth to someone who loves and serves the Lord, what are you saying about your Lord? What are you saying about the power of the cross? What are you saying about the power of the Holy Spirit? You know, the disciples didn't have it all right either. 
But they did silly things. They argued about silly things. See, you know, if you think you've got any kind of standing with God, well, you haven't been cut at the knees yet. Because Jesus meant it when he said, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> You're just going to be glad to make it without saying, I am, I am the, of the priesthood of God. I mean, come on, guys. We're wretches. And, and it's Jesus' church. We don't get to say where we go. We just better be glad we made it and praise him that we're in his kingdom. Ah, oh, many, many, many mighty men have fallen. Look at Solomon. If Solomon, that is what woke me up. If Solomon can fall, if Solomon could have had all the wisdom, be the most wise man ever, ever, and fall, Lord help us all. Because I've heard people say to me, well, you know, the Lord's only going to let you go down so far. Really? He gives us free will. And that's, that's reverent fear. You know, because see, that's the danger of thinking you're something special. Yeah, we're special. He made us in the image of himself and the angels. We're very special. We're his children. We're his creation. And when we're in the faith, we are children of the Most High God. But that doesn't guarantee you a seat in the front row. When you think you're all puffed up, and you think you're extra special, because I'll tell you what, a saint just means set aside. And saints are very humble. Okay? They're not going around touting where they think they are <laughs> in the congregation of the kingdom of God and their placement. They're not concerned about their placement. They're concerned about others. They're concerned about the words of Jesus Christ and his instruction of how we are to walk this walk. And we all fall short. But he's doing a work. And his work is a perfect work. Look at Thomas. We're going to see that in the scripture here. In John 20. So, Jesus just appeared in the midst of them. He did not walk through the door like a regular human being. He appeared in the midst of them while the door was shut. Because they were in there with the door shut because they, they knew that they were going to be persecuted for their faith. And they were trying to grasp that they just lost Jesus on the cross. They didn't understand the scripture. They didn't know some of the prophecies. They didn't know. They didn't gasp, grasp some of the things he was telling them when he said, you know, I go to put, prepare a place for you, but where I go, you cannot go, <laughs> but I will return. They, they didn't know what he meant, you know? They really didn't. So they were in there, and all of a sudden, you know, he just appears stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Therefore said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, I also send you. See, he doesn't make us walk it alone. Jesus had to walk it alone. He made the way. Now he's going to send us with the Holy Spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye power from on high. Yeah. 
Whosoever sins you forgive, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Yeah, it's the gospel. We have to tell of repentance of sins. We are to speak the truth. And that one unforgivable sin Just like the two, the, the, the husband and wife that lied to the Holy Spirit. They gave up the ghost right in front of the whole congregation. You know, that is written. And funny, it had something to do with money, right? Because you can't serve mammon and God both you can't it's a tool it's a testing tool too which are you going to serve yeah you gotta have it to survive you gotta have it to do things that the Lord would have you do but it's about what's in your heart are you wanting it all to to be rich and have all this prosperity that people twist in the gospel for your own bank account to be built up I mean it's the same thing guys I've seen this you know a lot of people buy all this expensive food survival food and things like that and I'm, I'm just saying you know that then their faith is in their substance not in the Lord and they'll say well the Lord gave it to me well the Lord put it on my heart. If you are storing up food, you better be feeding somebody. I'm just saying. <laughs> because it isn't going to do you any good if you've got a $5,000 worth of survival food stocked up and you got to flee. you got to flee. And chances are, if that's what your faith is in, you're going to end up having to walk away from that stuff. I'm just saying, God's not, he's going to get us to the point, sorry, I got a crazy kitty, he's going to get us to the point where we're either going to trust him or in our substance, and if we trust our in our substance and think, well, God gave it to me, well, then he will rip it away. If that's where our faith is, if we have more faith in the tangible than we do the spiritual, He's going to have to do something about that. Because he'd rather do that than lose you. <laughs> he's that, I mean, we've done it with our own children. <laughs> and he's a perfect parent. We mess up. So that's really what that verse is saying about forgiving the sins and retaining. A lot of people twist that up too. Verse 24, but Thomas, one out of the 12 called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Okay, so Thomas was missing. I don't know where Thomas was, but he was missing. And we call, you know, we know him as Doubting Thomas, right? That's funny because that's my son's name, but we call him TJ. And uh, <laughs> he's a junior. His dad's name was Thomas also. And, um, where well, yeah, you know <laughs> you need to be careful what you name your children because I'm telling you there's a lot in the name it really is <laughs> mm. and the other disciples therefore said unto him we have seen the Lord so they they <clears throat> they got in touch with Thomas and they're like look we've seen him but he said unto them, If not, I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into, a, into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will by no means believe. Thomas had to see to believe. He did. <clears throat> he, he didn't just want to see it. He wanted to experience it. <clears throat> he wanted to put his finger into his holes on his hands, where the nails were. And he wanted to put his hand, push his hand up in where they pierced his side, right? He says, because if I don't do that, I'm not believing it's him. 
you know, I mean, on the other hand, Thomas just wanted to make sure he didn't want to be fooled. He didn't want to be deceived. But he was a doubter. So he had to see for his own eyes. You know, the disciples are each of us, you know. It, it, all of us fit in there kind of somewhere. You know, we do. They are, we, our walks can be a lot like their, theirs. I mean, that's what it's given to us for, as an example. And after eight days, okay, so this was when Jesus first appeared before them. That was um, the first day of the week. It was after the first Sabbath since he had been crucified. All right, and I know many teach that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and resurrected on Sunday. Well, first of all, the calendar is all different and um, now. But actually, he was crucified on a Wednesday and rose on Saturday because Saturday... Our Saturday today, okay, it wasn't called Saturday. Those are all Gregorian calendar names, and it's after named after fake gods, Greek gods, okay? <laughs> we really, I mean, our calendar, our days of the week, it's, it's pretty dark, all right? But he rose on a Saturday because that would have been the true Sabbath, what we call Saturday now, all right? Their days were named just different. So, that throws people off sometimes okay but anyway it was a Wednesday and he rose on Saturday okay so this was eight days later after the first Sabbath since he was crucified and it said after eight days again his disciples were within and Thomas was with them this time then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. So he was just appearing. He was not walking through open doors. He wasn't opening the door. They were in their secret place, guys. Because they were going to be persecuted. And they had to wait. They were, they were congregating. They had a lot to discuss, you know, to be together. It was important that they were together. And they were in their secret place. <clears throat> and Jesus would appear, just appear. Because he was in the spirit. But he was being able to be touched. Okay? He wasn't in a body like he was before he was crucified. Alright? And Thomas was with them this time. And then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst of it and said peace be unto you so this is the third time he says peace be unto you he's basically saying don't be afraid peace this is his peace okay this is his peace see Jesus was now in his spiritual body Then said he to Thomas, bring here thy finger and behold my hands and bring there thy hand and thrust it into my side and become not faithless, but believing. See, he already knew what Thomas said. He was well aware of what Thomas was saying, what Thomas was thinking, what Thomas had in his heart. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, because thou hast seen me, Thou hast believed. Blessed are they who saw not and believed. Hmm. Well, you know what? I haven't seen Jesus resurrected. Standing in front of me. I haven't put my finger in his nail holes and his hands. I haven't thrust my hand into his side, and neither have you. And we believe. That's power, guys. That is power. 
And it says, therefore, many and other signs truly did Jesus in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been and therefore stand written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in order that believing you might have life in his name. Wow. I mean, everything he did isn't even in, in here. And then after this, then Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples upon the Sea of Tiberias. And manifested he himself. A double witness manifested. He revealed his power and his glory. It's amazing. I love the book of John. I really do and um, I, I really enjoy reading out of the companion Bible condensed because it really brings makes the true meaning of the words stand out I mean it's the same as the the companion Bible the notes from the transcripts the manuscripts but I just like how it's all put together in there and it used to be free online but that website has now not been renewed and uh, for whatever reason, you know, there's some faithful brethren that do put out what resources and tools. But, you know, many are going home, guys, and um, or having something happen that they just can't do those things anymore. And those things that we've taken for granted, uh, we're going to start seeing them go. People that we really learned a lot from and people that have shared... The, their, their testimonies and their and the joy of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit you know we're just going to start seeing more and more go home it's a precious thing and then if we we must have a hard paperback or a hardback Bible I mean you need it because you're there could come a day very soon where you cannot if you're relying completely on technology to read the word. So if anybody needs a Bible on here, just please get in contact with me. Just leave me a message. I will get a Bible to you. Because it's important. It really is. He's written it in our hearts, but, you know, it really is a powerful thing to read the Word of God and for Him to give us understanding. It really is. So, with that said, I am going to go to the book of Isaiah now. And we're going, I know we've been here before, but wow, is this, you know, the book of Isaiah, I love it. It's beautiful. It just shows the prophecy and the power of of our Messiah written so so long ago God had this plan from the beginning for salvation it's amazing and that kingdom of darkness you know it's been on God's <clears throat> countdown for a long time since the fall before humanity was even here and um, it's, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. I have several things in the Bible that I just, that are stories that touch my heart so, so deeply. And uh, that have been so profound in my walk for my situation. And the Lord just opened it up to show me the hope, the promise, the power. It changed my, my faith forever. And I might forget a lot of things that I've read. Sometimes, you know, you'll read it again. You'll go, oh, I remember this, you know. But then there's times when you've read something in the Word that is just so profound that it sticks with you forever. 
that's amazing to me because you you could be going through hell living hell and you'll read something in the word that just is so profound to you you personally that you'll start leaping for joy and praising the Lord and it, it, it could, you could be in the midst of someone passing away <laughs> it's amazing to see his power and I'll tell you then you see something the experiences I've had he's been he's been so amazing to me the power he has shown in my it was especially in my in my early walk and it seems like you know those times get longer and longer and longer that you see or feel something like you did when he was really opening his hand to you and I imagine that's what all of those that walked with Christ were going through in the end of their walks or in the you know after especially after Jesus was crucified and he appeared back to them and he gave them the Holy Spirit and you know when they went through persecutions and trials and sufferings I'm sure sometimes it felt like it had been forever since they saw something and it might have even been a short period of time but in the meantime <laughs> you know you ever been through something where two days felt like eternity four days felt like 400 years yeah he's growing us it's like exercise yeah you start out and you really feel an impact from it and then as you get your muscles built up well, you have to do more and more <laughs> exercise more and more and you feel it to feel an effect kind of thing like going on a diet and shrinking your stomach in the beginning you're just hungry all the time as you shrink your stomach you know you're you don't experience those deep hunger pains you, you have to go to another plateau it's kind of like where we are I think I'm ready for our next step and he says no you're not you got a little more work to do and it just seems like you're just you, you battle within yourself too sometimes but he's mighty to do it you know we can do nothing without him so we're gonna go to Isaiah here and I and again like I said I know that uh, I've covered this chapter before but it is it is one amazing uh, the book of Isaiah is just totally amazing but it really opens up something <laughs> the power of what God's plans is was and to come so we're going to start with verse 20 and then we're going to talk about it out of uh, Isaiah 26 verse 20 go or come my people enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee hide thyself as it were for a little moment soon until the indignation be overpassed for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That is the return of our Lord and Savior, guys. That is God's wrath. So he's telling us as his people what to do in that time. And he's telling us to go into our chambers. What is the chambers, guys? Well, I'm going to tell you what. It's a spiritual place. It's, a, it's, it's our private place with God. It is the bridal chamber. Yeah. It's amazing what this word chambers means. And shut thy doors about thee. You know, we're going to close ourselves into him. We're going to press into him. 
And you know, this is why the devil will just do everything he can to stop us from praying. And there's something inside of ourselves, guys, that fights this. There is. You know, yes, there will be outside forces, okay, that'll interrupt, disrupt, do all kinds of things to keep you from praying. But there's also some kind of resistance within us that we have to discipline. I'm telling you, this is something, if you really think about it, every time you want to vent, every time you feel like murmuring, people think there's no harm in venting. And I can tell you there is because that is time spent. You could have been in your secret place with God and praying to the only one who could possibly do anything about your problem. The only one. Because here's the deal, guys. As a person who has vented, murmured, and I look back and I'm thinking, this is harmless. I'm just venting. You're feeding into your soul. You're sowing into yourself that negativity of you releasing through your verbal communications, even if it's to yourself, negative thoughts and emotions. And it's, you know, God doesn't like it. He says he doesn't like murmuring. And the reason why is because it will give us a defeatist attitude. It will start sowing into our hearts. So if we, instead of venting, go to the one that can make a difference, that can the only one that can know your problem to the degree that your problem can be known. And, and you know, guys, it's, it's almost like it doesn't matter what the situation is. It, it's all getting to the point. It's all getting to the point where it's the same as someone who's been diagnosed with stage four cancer and given months to live. And what do I mean by that? Because we are getting to a time that either God is going to move on our situation and our conditions and a miracle is going to happen or we're going to return home to our Lord. That's really how that's where we're coming to. This is the point we're coming to. Because this is what's going to happen in humanity, in this world. It's like getting a terminal diagnosis. And there's really nothing more that anyone can do, physically, human, possibly, to do. All has been done that can be done. And we're either going to experience and have faith that God's will will prevail and that he's either going to do something so miraculous and magnificent in our situations, in our lives, or we're going, our race is over. We're going home. We finished our race. I mean, when you stop to think about things, when you have issues and problems in your life that are the equivalent to getting a terminal diagnosis, that there is no human being that can change your situation. None. You can have people that have pray for you and have compassion and are willing to roll with the punches 
with you. But you're going to find in some situations that are too extreme for others to to walk through it with you. They just, you'll find out who's who. You really will. And you might find out that you're alone. The most isolated you've ever been. But the closest you've ever been to God. And it's all about spending that time with him in prayer. And, and let me tell you, all of our prayer lives could use some tweaking and um, more of it. More of him and less of us, right? More, more of you, Jesus, and less of us. Because that's really, it's like the earth has gotten a terminal diagnosis, guys. The planet itself our earthly home but here's the thing you know Jesus is the supernatural answer to earthly problems which are spiritual also that the root is spiritual and then it comes out into the physical realm it's just the way it works and we are in a spiritual war but we're going to see a lot manifesting in the physical. It's based on the spiritual. And at one point, when that veil is torn of dimensions, spiritual and physical realms combine, which is what happens in Revelation when that uh, bottomless pit is opened. And I know many people say, well, then, you know, it's in that time when the Holy Spirit's taken away. Listen, as long as there are God's children and his people, you know, his, his children, as long as they're here, they're, the Holy Spirit will be here. But there's going to be a moment, a moment of indignation and wrath. which is no longer the grace and mercy and long suffering because it's like you ever just like your kids just push your buttons push your buttons and finally you're just like that's it I've reached my limit here's what's going to happen you go in timeout you sit in the chair you go to your room you know you're you're starting to put to lay it down you know your long suffering just ended you're like okay I got to take action now I warned them and I warned them. You know, I, all parents have gone through that. And it's like that. But your love never stops. You're correcting them because you love them. Think about it like that. Because God is omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's in everything he's doing. So how could the Holy Spirit be gone? And he even says, anyone that calls out on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, there will be that remnant. Remember that remnant that sees these things. They even see that earthquake, that great earthquake that rips Jerusalem in half. And 7,000 are slain right there in the street. That remnant calls out. You know, they did not accept the Messiah. They were just, they were not believers. So please, you know, be careful when we say things like that because we really don't, we can't wrap our mind around our father's actions and motives, you know, unless we have intently had it revealed to us through the Holy Spirit in his word and know his plan inside and out. And, you know, God just, 
reveals to us what we're able to handle. Because I can tell you the vastness of the word of God is so huge, so powerful. It would blow our little pea brain minds that in, in the condition they're in, in the state that they're in right now. We could not handle his truth, his vast truth, the totality of who he is. We really, it's mind blowing. So I'm going to read to you this chapter, Isaiah 26, of what he was talking about before he was telling them to go into their chamber, their secret chamber. Well, it appears that the page I was on just shut down. All right, here we go. You know, these are the burdens also. And uh, the burdens of Isaiah, which are tied to Revelation. And chapter 26. Is prophesying about what God's going to do in those end times. And it says, In that future day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Yeah. So, guess what? Salvation is not coming to an end, guys. All right? He's saying, in that future day, in that future day, it's praise. And his strong city, that's new city Jerusalem. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bul bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which maintaineth fidelity may enter in. Thou will keep him perfect. Thou will keep, keep him in perfect peace whose thought is stayed on thee because he confideth in thee. Oh, perfect peace. Peace, peace. This is true peace. This is the peace of our Lord and Savior, his salvation, his saving grace. This is the mindset, our thoughts, the mind, the thought that has stayed on him. Perfect peace because we confide in him. Okay, there's what we were just talking about. Venting, murmuring, no, no, confide in him. We have to learn this. Confide in him. And it's repeated again in verse 4. Confide ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is a rock of ages. Listen, he knows our problems. He knows it like no one else. He knows it better than you can even describe it to vent. He doesn't like the murmuring. It feeds ungodliness, guys. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. And people think it's harmless, and it's not. Oh, I'm just venting. No. No. I have watched some bad things happen because of this. I have. Well, guys, I'm getting so many interruptions. Ugh. All right. I'll be right back. You know, the enemy does not want this message out today. No. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. But that's okay. Because God's on the throne. His will will be done. All right. So, you, he, you see right here. Thou will keep him, talking about us, those that maintaineth fidelity in him. Okay? Will keep him. He will keep us. The Lord will keep us in perfect peace. Not the peace of the world, guys, but his peace. You know that peace, he says, peace be unto you. He said it twice to the disciples 
when he appeared in the room in the midst of them when the door was shut. Okay, and he did it again. He said the same thing to them when Thomas was there. Peace be unto you. All right, this is where we're getting somewhere. He will keep us in perfect peace when our thoughts and minds are stayed on him because we confideth in him. Okay, are, can, is that making more sense when I put it that way? And then verse four says, confide, all right, confide ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is a rock of ages. Okay, guys, he is the rock, not the fake rock. He is the rock. And why is he the rock of ages? Because the ages are the aeons. They are the world that was, the world that is, and the world that is to come. The time, the age, the era. Ah. Verse 5. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high, the lofty city. He layeth it low, he layeth it low even to the earth. Yes, he's going to cut down all these things that are exalt themselves above God. This is what he's doing. He's bringing down the false gods. He's bringing down Lucifer. He's bringing down the kingdom of darkness. All right. He layeth it low, even to the earth. Now it was put there twice. That is a double emphasis for a double witness. It is a truth. It is truth. That is like when Jesus would say, verily, verily, all right, it's a double witness. He is telling you, he's bringing that stuff down. He layeth it low, even to the earth. He bringeth it even to the dust. It's going to be pulverized powder. The enemy is going to be powder pulverized. And then he says, the foot shall tread it down. Even the feet of the afflicted and the steps of the lowly ones. You, do you realize that you are going to beat the beast system and Lucifer and all his little minions into by your own feet. This is where Jesus gave us the power to tread on serpents and scorpions. We are going to tread this kingdom down. Dust under our feet. Pulverized by the power of our Lord. And it says the way of a just one is a perfect level way. Well, there is only one that is just, guys. The just one. That's our Lord. And we are only to follow him. You know, we cannot be him, but he's in us, okay? The way of a just one. The path of a just one. So this is our walk, okay? This is our walk. <sighs> the foot shall tread Tread it down. Even the feet of the afflicted and the steps of the lowly ones. The way of a just one is a perfect level way. The power is from him. This is the earth, the ground. The poor, the afflicted, the feet of the poor, the afflicted, the wretched, okay? <laughs> and the steps of the lowly ones. These are not people that are exalted. These are people that have been afflicted, pushed down, oppressed by the oppressor, the prisoners. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> are you following me? The way, the path of the just one, a just one, the just one, the uprightness. You know, our righteousness is in Jesus Christ. It's not of ourselves, guys. The path or the way of a just one is a perfect level way. Thou must upright, thou most upright, okay, sorry, I'm having trouble reading today. Thou most upright dost ponder the path of a just one. Yea, in the way of thy judgment, judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee with the dawn. For when thy righteous, for when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. <laughs> you know, we want to sell him so short, don't we? 
don't we? We want to say it's all the way our paradigm and our mind and what we've heard. But when we read, we see he's doing something huge. Huge, right? And has your soul cried out to him in the night? I know mine has. I know. I've been going through a sifting. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yeah. Yeah, what's the night? It's a time of darkness. It's a time of... You're, without him, you have no light. You have no hope. You have no peace. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee, the Lord, with the dawn. Yes, it's often darkest. It is the darkest, the coldest time before the dawn, guys. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to a lawless one, yet will he not learn righteousness? In the land of the uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. This lawless one. Let favor be showed to a lawless one, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Well, this means the wicked. It's talking about the wicked. Verse 11. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, fire shall devour thine adversaries. He, this is what he's going to burn up, guys. This is what he's destroying. He's destroying his adversaries. And this is, this is big, okay? This is big, what he's saying here. Verse 12, Lord, thou will arrange peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works for us. O Lord, our God, other owners beside thee have lorded it over us, but by thee only will we call upon thy name. Yeah, yeah, those wicked, lawless ones, that beast system, Oh, yeah, they've lorded it over us. But they're going to cross a line when they tell us that their laws are going to prevent us from worshiping openly our God and want us to accept Satan and his kingdom of darkness as our God. That's, that's what's going to draw the line. And when he claims to be God and stands there first in hearts, the hearts of men. When he stands in the hearts of men and claims to be the creator, the God, and humanity has been duped. And when he's finally pushes it past the limit that God is like, that's it. This is a line and there's no more. You're not crossing it again, Lucifer. That's what this is talking about. That beast system. That when that second beast stands and is in power, this it entity that has now materialized when that thing which is Lucifer Satan himself when that crosses the line it's over okay and yeah we have been oppressed we we just did the study on the oppressor <sighs> this beast system will oppress it press look People who are the least of these, the disabled, the elderly, those who are in prison, those who are in psychiatric hospitals, you really don't know what these people have gone through. 
you really don't realize the spirits that come over people who are supposed to be responsible professionals that lord over that system. It's cruel. I'm telling you, I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen it all my life. We want to say it's those that have lost their minds or have a disability, a cognition or functional mental, mental disability. You want to point your finger and say, well, they have something dark. But I'll tell you what's even darker are some of the, it's the system, the system. <laughs> because it's only breaking, take, Satan likes to take something that's weak, okay? He'll take something that's weak. It's like a bully, okay? Think on the schoolyard. Here's a little kid. He may not have all the, um, he may be short and small, petite. He don't have all that size. And he might be a little different. And here comes the bully. You know, the bully ain't going over there picking on the biggest guy in the schoolyard. No, no, the bully is going to go after the one that's an easy target. Satan, where do you think these techniques come from in humanity? They're replicating Satan. And this is what Satan does. He'll take someone who has a broken heart, mind, soul that is not accountable because they're not... There's something... That they don't have the wherewithal. And so, Satan will use this. And then there's a system, right? Or we can call it the legal system because most of these people who have had some kind of a brain disorder, disability, have been, their condition has been criminalized and they've gone through a lot of abuse and a lot of the medications do more harm than good. Truth. And we want to look at these people and say, oh, I think they're under some kind of demonic possession or something. But we're not looking <laughs> at the bully. We're looking at the one that's been bullied and traumatized. <sighs> and believe me, that beast system, well, there's your mental health system. There's your justice system. And let's face it, there's no real help the system that is designed to help these people is more dysfunctional than, than their behavior. <laughs> and so they've ended up criminalizing it. And so everybody just, you know, eventually they're going to do something that's not acceptable in society or they're going to do something that is against the law when it's really, you know, they're not even accountable. I mean, think about an epileptic. Is an epileptic in the middle of an epileptic seizure who's flailing their arms, having a seizure. Are they accountable that they just flung their arms all over the place and might have even bust somebody's nose, might have broke something? This is the mentality we're dealing with. And we're not looking at the root. We're, we're, we're just seeing a behavior. And so we're like, we don't realize there is something that is using and oppressing. It's really something to think about, guys.
We need to change these preconceived notions and paradigms that we have in our mind of what is really what we're seeing. And then, you know, we're, we're not looking at the bully. We're just looking at individuals who are broken. And the truth is, if you were you or I, we don't know what we you look, if you if you were in that person's shoes. And you're not in control of your own faculties. You're not in control of your own ability to have a thought. Hey, we've all been there. You ever had depression? You ever had a moment where you had anxiety? You ever had a moment? Well, just to magnify that times 10,000. I went into a depression before, not into me. I, prayer wasn't even helping me. I had to really, oh, it, I would never want to go through that again. And I would never wish that on anybody. Because I got a glimpse into what some people live daily experiencing. And I don't know how they continue through their lives in that condition. I think the Lord let me go through it because he wanted to show me what it was, what it was like to live under that. Same way with anxiety. I hadn't had anxiety like I, I never experienced an anxiety attack until one day I just was experiencing a full-on anxiety attack in a grocery store I mean nothing was even happening to me it's all of a sudden and I, I think God let me experience these things and he's you know, I've watched what has happened in the mental health system. I have watched it all my life. I have seen the oppression of those that we would cast away and blame them. And people don't want nothing to do with them. Nothing. Not the people in the churches. Not neighbors. Nothing. They're like, oh, here they come again. Oh, Lord, shut the door. <laughs> Nobody will pray for them. They think that they're wicked. It, it's, we've really got to wrap our minds about what's happening here on this earth. And what the spiritual war is. And let's stop blaming the prisoners and start praying for them. And let's attack the bully because that's our job our job is to fight the spiritual war against the bully but then we kick the very people and situations and that the devil lord help you if you ever got in the grasp of the devil like that and there was nothing. You had to depend on somebody else to fight the war for you. Oh my gosh. And people don't want nothing to do with you. I mean, it's just like that guy in the tombs that had 6,000 demons. He had a legion of 6,000 demons that went into 2,000 pigs. And the, they were so bad, the pigs didn't want them. And the pigs killed themselves. I mean, we really are not being with our eyes open of what we are, what we're fighting here. That's one of my passions. And let me tell you, I have been in the crosshairs all my life. And good, well-meaning people will not even Admit that this is a spiritual war. 
and that somebody needs to be covering and praying and helping these people who are victims of bullying. But we hear all about bullying today and we're hearing about little teenagers and little kids killing themselves over bullying as young as first and second grade now do you think god's letting us see these conditions so that we will start to wake up mm. just goes to to show are we are we believing what god says in his word about this spiritual war and who the enemy is or are we are we looking at people who didn't stand a chance that nobody fought for. I mean, you know, some people get bullied so much that they end up realizing if they become a bully, well, then nobody will bother them. Because <laughs> nobody stood up for them. And then I'll tell you where that spirit of the bully comes from. And it's in the beast system today and it's getting more and more oppressive and it does push down the least of these well i'm gonna take a break here and do a part two i'm gonna leave you with that that's a lot to chew on but you don't want to miss the rest of isaiah 26 because we're gonna cover it I hope we're armoring up. I hope we're starting to see our responsibility as the body of Christ and who we're supposed to be fighting for and who we're supposed to be fighting against. Because there are the least of these that do not have anybody fighting for them. And I do believe it's, it's when Jesus said that, what you do unto the least of these. And he was talking about those that are in prison, those that are without a coat, those that are naked, those that are homeless, those that are the ones you that might smell and might act funny and act threatening and are their souls in trouble, guys. And it's, it's really a test to those that claim to be children of the Most High God. To see if we really understand what Jesus was saying and if we're going to follow it. My heart bleeds for these people. There's too many. There's too many. And maybe it's growing because we haven't fought the right fight. We haven't really fought this spiritual war. We didn't take it seriously. We still are looking at people. The physical realm well i'll be back god bless i'm gonna leave you with a really favorite song of mine it's so good we're gonna play i I'm, i played it at the beginning i'm gonna play it at the end god bless you all love you
And I don't wanna spend my life stuck in a pattern. And I don't wanna gain this world but lose what matters. And so I'm giving up everything because I wanna be different. I wanna be changed.